He's been making sense of science for us for 40 years. And every year he takes your questions. And I love questions like this, where you look at something in everyday life and you say, you know, like, why is it like that? That's how science works. Questions like, why don't they fly to the moon anymore? Want to know the answer? Well, we sat down with CBC science correspondent and host of Quirks and Quarks, Bob McDonald, for a special two-part one-on-one. And tonight, here's a special preview. So let's get some answers. So here we are again. <laughs> Good to see you again, Peter. Good to see you, and great questions yeah, yeah, this year, like some really wonderful ones. And lots of them. So right. You know what that means. Well, we you got to be fast. Okay. we got to be fast, we got to get right at it. <laughs> so uh, let's do that. Fred DeRosa from Ottawa. Where do groundhogs put all the dirt that they dig up to excavate their burrows? Around the entrances to their burrows, the ground is almost flush to the surrounding earth. Where did all that dirt go? <laughs> That's a great question. I had to look this one up. Uh, it turns out that uh, groundhogs can, can dig up like, uh, you know, a couple of hundred kilos of dirt. And uh, there's two kinds of entrances. One does have a mound and one doesn't. So when a, when a groundhog digs a burrow, the first entrance that they build goes up. And that's so that it won't flood when it rains. They're very clever. So they go up, so all the dirt falls out, and it does make a mound at the front, and they use that as a perch so they can look around and see who's coming. Then they build their inner chambers within, and all that goes down that upward-facing tunnel. And then they build a second entrance, which is their escape to get out if they need to. That's dug from the inside out. So that one will not have a mound on it. So what he's seeing is the second <laughs> entrance that doesn't have the mound. The first one actually does. They're, they're incredible diggers, but yeah. uh, they want to build their nest in there. They actually build a, a, a latrine. They, they build a washroom in there, and they, they're very clean, so they do that. Uh, total distance Bob. between the two, I'm not sure. Really? It's true. I, I looked it up. That's what they do. <laughs> they build a latrine. Yeah, they build a little latrine. <laughs> All right. I will never look at groundhogs the same again. <laughs> from Randy Chappelle from Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. He's got this video for us. My question is, is why don't they fly to the moon anymore? Well, we stopped going to the moon because we wanted to build an international space station. And the space station took um, 30 years to build. It cost actually more than uh, going to the moon to do that. And so we built space shuttles, which were delivery trucks, and they could only reach the space station. They were built to carry weight, not to go distance. And so we just gave all of that up. And uh, so now people are talking about going back to the moon or going beyond the moon to Mars. So it was a conscious decision on our part to go locally, just spend our time going around the Earth and build a habitat rather than try to explore out. I think now we're going to see a change in that to uh, start going to Mars, but it's still going to be till about 2030 before that happens. But in terms of the moon, there's obviously still things we can learn from the moon. Oh yeah, I mean the moon uh, has a lot of minerals on it that uh, we haven't explored yet. There's ice at the South Pole, there's still a lot we can learn. And astronomers would like to put an observatory on the far side of the moon, away from the Earth, because the Earth is very noisy, uh, especially radio telescopes. They'd like to be on the, on the far side and make a, an observatory out of it. So there's still a lot we could do. We could use it as a stepping stone to get to Mars, a staging area out. So there's a debate about whether it's better to go back to the moon or go to Mars. A lot of people want to just get on with it. Let's get out to Mars. It's a whole planet. There's a lot more we could do there, but who knows? <laughs> okay, here's uh, one from Mo Kopiak in Duncan, British Columbia. And I, it's another one that I love. This is a great one. Has the total amount of water in, on, and around the Earth changed? No, uh, which is, this is a fascinating question because the water we have today is the same water we've always had. So the water came from the original cloud that formed our whole solar system in the Earth. So it was embodied within the Earth when the Earth coalesced out of that. So it spouted out of volcanoes. The Earth started out as sort of a molten ball and then it cooled and it shrank. And when it did, the crust cracked and, and all this water and vapor came out of volcanoes. We still get a bit of it coming out today, some volcanoes, but we don't have as many as we used to. That's where a lot of it came. Some of it came from space. Comets and asteroids hit the Earth. We were bombarded. We had the crap beat out of us in the early days of our, our solar system formation. That's why the moon is covered in craters. And they brought ice and, and water with them. But since then, it's the same water. It's been recycled again and again and again. We have ice, we have fresh water, and we have salt water. And what we're doing with things like climate change is we're changing the balance between how much ice, how much fresh, and how much salt. So the ice melts, it becomes fresh water, goes into our rivers, lakes, but all rivers lead to the sea. 
then it eventually becomes salty. And as climate change gets warmer, the rivers and lakes are drying up and we end up with more salt and less of the other. But the total amount of water we have has always been the same. So when you take a drink of water, Peter, mm -hmm. that glass, that water that you drink has been through a dinosaur. Think about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. It has. Another video. Michael Bechevel, or Bechevel. Why don't we ask Michael to pronounce it from Langford, BC, <laughs> here he is. Hi, my name is Michael Bessevel and I live in Langford, BC. And my question for Bob McDonald is, while observing a spider slowly descending on a single thread, it suddenly stopped and started to ascend. What happens to that thread? Where does it go? Yeah, how come there's not a loop left over when it climbs back up again? <laughs> they actually eat it. They eat their, their, their webs, and uh, they, they produce their web through uh, three holes in the front of their face called spinnerets, and they put out different kinds of thread. There's one that's sticky, that'll catch the prey, but there's also one that isn't. And when they're making their web, they alternate between the two, so they walk on the one that's not sticky. That's why spiders don't get caught in their own webs, and the prey gets caught in the one that, that is sticky. But it takes a lot of energy for a spider to make a web, and the web is made of protein. We're made of protein. And so very often after a web has been up for a while and the protein is starting to get a little hard and it's not as flexible anymore, the spiders will actually eat their own web and they'll, they'll get it back into their body so they can basically recycle it again. And it's quite remarkable watching them build a web because they, it, it, they're quite fast at building a complicated they, web. They are, I mean, they're amazing engineers. And the, the way they do it, if they're going between two branches, you ever wonder how they do that? They get it suspended. How do mm. they get that first one across at the top? They have a thing called ballooning where they'll let the web out and they just let the wind carry it. Just let the wind blow out. So first of all, they, they'll pick a branch that's downwind from them and they'll just let the thread out and then it'll go up and it'll just kind of snag on the branch. That's their first one across. They go to the middle and then they drop down, which is what this guy was seeing, and to the ground. And now they've got a triangle and it's attached to the ground. And then it's from that structure that they start building the orb out. And they can also, if they want to move, and they do this with their, their young ones, they don't want little spiders around, they'll parachute. So they build another one if it's a really windy day and the web actually goes up and then they fly on it. And they'll, they'll go up. Spiders have, seen, have been seen way up in the atmosphere flying on their webs, so they use them as, as parasails as well. They're amazing engineers. Oh, gosh. They're I'm amazing also, engineers. I, I hadn't realized any of that. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Here's Carol's question. There are more people on the Earth than ever before. Does this mean that the Earth is heavier than it was when it began? Yes, there are more people, uh, and uh, I guess there's more life than there was originally, but we are made of chemicals that came from the Earth itself. We are just very complicated chemical reactions, and so there's no net gain in mass. There's a change of energy, a change of form, but it is still the same stuff. We've come from the Earth, and we go back to the Earth, dust to dust and all of that. So, no, there is no net balance. However, the Earth is getting heavier because of dust that comes from space. We're plowing through the solar system and there's a lot of dust and dirt out there and we pick, out a, pick up about 100 tons a day of dust from space. Most of it burns up in the atmosphere. Sometimes big ones come down and we get meteors and you know asteroid kill or dinosaur killers and stuff like that. But we, so the earth is getting heavier in that respect but not because of humanity. It's all an energy balance. Next question from Hugh McCauley from Roberts Creek BC writes, why do we get bags under our eyes when we're tired? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about this as I was sitting in makeup just before coming <laughs> in here, because the first thing they do is they put the color under your eyes, right? Exactly. So there's two things that happen under your eyes is they get dark and you get baggy. The darkness is because the skin under your eyes is the thinnest skin in your body, some, almost the thinnest anywhere. Uh, it's, it's much thinner, it's, it's half the thickness of your cheeks, for example. And so that makes it transparent. You can see through it. So you can see the dark blood vessels underneath, and some time blood vessels are blue so that's what can make them dark and bagginess comes from again the fact that it's thin and it's not as strong so as you get older uh, if you get really tired or if you eat a lot of salt your eyes get puffy and that will cause them to stretch out but then if they're not strong when the puffiness goes down then the skin is just loose it's not as strong so it gets baggy that's what happens with age uh, it can also happen with your eyelids as well so there are lots of products out there to try to tighten them up or you can get some cosmetic surgery but it's just a yeah. product of age that's can, just the way it is as you say cosmetic surgery will yeah physically tighten it up right but we don't do that we don't do that as no we're all we're all natural tell. on cbc <laughs> yes, here. yes absolutely <laughs> 
Um, okay, John Dorn of Summerlin, BC. He's got this video for us. We have two dogs that I walk daily. The bigger dog named Cinnamon is a border collie cross. She runs by raising diagonally opposite legs. The little dog named Chance is a Shih Tzu Terrier cross and he raises both front legs, then both back legs. If they both evolve from the same source, why do they run differently? You know, I was thinking about this <laughs> over the weekend before we did this and I was watching my dog uh -huh. and uh, at first I thought he was doing the two feet at a time yeah, thing, yeah. but then I realized it was diagonally, but yeah. clearly John Dorn's got uh, dogs <laughs> with different running patterns. Well, this is great. I love questions like this. Where yeah. you look at something in everyday life and you say, you know, like, why is it like that? That's how science works. Science looks at nature and just asks a question. Then you try to find out. So quadrupeds, four-legged four animals, have different ways of moving. And uh, where I come from in Victoria, we have these horses that pull carriages through the city. And if you listen to a horse that's pulling and just walking along slowly, they're going cuck clop cuck clop cuck clop cuck clop So when they're walking, they do one leg at a time. They always have three feet on the ground. At all, so it's one after another. And they, they do it diagonally. You know, front, back, front, back, alternating like this. Then they can trot. And dogs usually trot when you're walking them along. So they're still doing diagonally, but now they're hopping. So they're keeping two legs on the ground at a time. They're going alternate like this as a trot. When they run, you get thoroughbreds at the racetrack. And dogs, when they're running, chasing a ball, they're doing front, two front, and two back. That's the gallop. Because you can get more force if you do both legs at once to push. So that's the fastest they can go. So you've got to walk, one leg, a trot, two legs. And then in the gallop, there's actually a point where all four legs are mm -hmm. off the ground at once. So if you have a big dog and a little dog, a trot to the big dog, because its legs are so long, is a gallop to the little dog. <laughs> so the little dog's got to keep up. So he's in a gallop all the time, or she. So the little dogs, when they trot, they're way too slow. They can't keep up. So if this person watches their little dog just walking around the house, you will see that it'll walk. Maybe it'll trot now and then, but the little ones usually have to gallop just to keep up to the rest of us. Last question from me. Um, they always ask me, does he know all this stuff? <laughs> How does he know all this stuff? It's because I've been at this a long time. <laughs> you know, I started working here at the CBC doing science documentaries in 1976. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been talking to scientists around the world. And on Quirks and Quarks, every week, scientists tell me their stories, and it's all new stuff. So my education has come from the people who do it, from who do the science. And over time, I guess some of it's stuck. <laughs> so many people it. think you're a scientist yourself. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a journalist. But you're an honorary scientist. Uh, yes, yes. I've, I've got honorary <laughs> degrees. Having that closeness to so many over time yeah, through, uh, yeah, through interviews. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinated me. And plus, uh, as far as space goes, I mean, that's my favorite topic, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of a personal thing for me. So that's how I, I got a lot of it. And you just learn things as you go. Well, we're lucky you share it with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Peter. It's always great to do this every Until year. Until next year. Okay, see you then. Thanks, Bob.